Okay, let's double test that everything is working all right. Uh, test. Uh, test. Yep, that's great. Okay, cool. So let's get into it. Um, sick. All right, cool. So today we are getting into our last section before the exam, which I will tell you, um, while it is some cool stuff, it is once again part of this slight diversion from our story of complex analysis. It's um, it's it's cool. This is cooler than the last part to me, at least. Um, and I think you'll like it, at least as a technique. I think it's pretty interesting. But it is not part of this classic complex analysis story. So that 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 will make this like less of a focus in this class, um, relatively speaking. Correspondingly, also because the uh, homework assignment will you actually have to practice this out, um, which only has like one problem on this, um, won't be due until after the exam. So, meh. You might not see any of this on the exam except maybe in like a bonus problem or something like that maybe something like that hint hint um anyways uh you guys have pretty much gotten everything that you will have to do on the exam um if you didn't see i sent out an announcement today that i was wrong when i had uh stated last time that i believed we covered everything we needed to do the homework um i wrote that homework before we actually you know obviously it was posted before we got through the lecture last friday and uh, i had written it with quite a while ago now with the uh expectation that we would somehow manage to make it through all of that gigantic section um despite it not really being that important to us in the class so most of those problems while i think there might be a couple of techniques if you're there are some ways to do it if you're clever with using purely things that we know they are um well actually one of them no that you'd essentially have to rederive something we didn't cover um it, 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 either way they were all much more difficult to do like that than i had intended and they really should be done with material that we didn't end up actually going over because it wasn't it's not that relevant to us right now um so don't worry about that part. I sent out the announcement. You don't have to turn anything in from that part. I will post a document tonight um, with a few more examples of what uh, you should expect to see on the exam um, in terms of problems there. There won't be many and they'll be relatively easy since that's not really our main focus here, right? Um, anyway, so that aside, let's get into what we're doing today. We are talking about... Ooh, let's hope. Let's hope that this tablet works well tonight. Why is it doing that? Okay, there we go. Good. All right. So, oh, my dog is going crazy. Um, okay, excuse me for one second. Okay, sorry about that. My dog was just absolutely losing his mind, I think, at, I don't know, a coyote outside, something? Um, so let's let's get back into it. Okay, so today in 4.4, we're gonna, ooh, that is not a highlighter. We're gonna talk about the evaluation of infinite series via um, the residue theorem. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the kind of complex version of a partial fraction expansion. It's, it's neat. Um, so let's start out with infinite series. This one is kind of an obvious technique. So the idea is that we'll evaluate infinite series doubly infinite, so from n equals negative infinity to infinity of fn, sums like that, where f is, and we're going to have to make this assumption, a meromorphic function with a finite number of poles, none of which are integers. We will be able to deal with a case where we have integer poles, but um, for now, let's just start by assuming that f is meromorphic, finite number of poles, none are integers. So if you had, say, oh, I don't know, g of z, 
a meromorphic function whose only poles are simple poles at the integers, only poles, simple poles at the integers, and all of the residues are one, then at the integers, the residues of f of g times, or f of z times g of z are just the values of f at each of the integers, right? So if you enclose those guys in a closed curve, gamma, enclose minus n through n, say, then by the residue theorem, if you integrate around that contour, g of z, f of z, well, then you get 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of g of z, f of z at the poles of g of z inside of that contour, which are just these integers. And the poles, since these are simple and the residues are all 1, we'll just get f evaluated at n, right? And sum all those guys up, right? Then you'll also have the residues of these guys at the poles of f. Okay, so if you can handle um, this chunk right here, if this piece right here, say, like, I don't know, goes to zero as n goes to infinity or something like that, then, then we'll be able to say something nice about this. Really, all we need is that, um, really, we can even call this, like, gamma n. So if, um, if this, like, converges as gamma gets big, and um, if this piece also converges as gamma gets big, so both these guys need to converge as gamma gets big, then obviously we can come up with a formula for this, right? Okay, kind of cool. That makes some sense, right? Just rearrange this, and then you get that the sum from minus n to n of fn is equal to, well, this contour integral minus the residues of g of z, f of z at the poles of f, right? Now, if you have, say, finitely many poles, right? A finite number of poles for f, then this piece is always good. It just becomes this piece that we have to care about. So we're sort of back in the same kind of situation we were dealing with last time. That is, we are looking now at um, a, a situation where we're like, okay, so we need a finite number of poles, some condition about where they can be, right? Before we were saying like, oh, not on the real axis or only so many on the real axis or something like that. Um, we're just saying here, maybe they're not on the integers, right? Then if there's a nice growth condition on g of z, f of z, right? We'll be able to evaluate the sum. So don't think of this as weird at all. Um, in a certain sense, we were evaluating sums last time or series, right? Uh, just because integrals are, I mean, that big, that big, this shape is a, is a stretched out S for summation, right? It is a, uh, integrals are defined in terms of the limits of sums. Yeah. So that's some calc one stuff, you know? So if this guy has a controllable limiting behavior as gamma gets big, we'll get information about this sum as n goes to infinity in terms of the residues of g of z, f of z at the poles of f. Um, so what could you use? I'm going to actually highlight this in an even more obvious color. A great function to use, this g of z, which we've just kind of pushed to the back, is uh, something like, I don't know, pi cotangent of pi z, maybe? Why this is this a good one? Well, because pi cotangent of pi z put in any integer, and that that is uh, you know cotangent of pi times an integer. Ooh, oops, that's not good. That's a that's a pole, right? It's not defined there. It's defined everywhere except at the integers. And if you look at what those poles are, you'll end up getting out one. Or sorry, what the residues are at those poles, you'll always end up getting out one. So that's kind of nice. Um, I, uh, I encourage you to verify that if you want, but that is a classic choice, though you may want to use different ones. In fact, on your homework, you will want to use a different one, and I will give you a hint at the end of either this lecture or next lecture. Um, so, I mean, of course, this is always true that if you just do this contour integral around gamma, 
um, you just get 2 pi i times the sum of all of the residues of g of z, f of z inside of gamma. So that's just super obvious. Um, now, if some of the poles of f happen to be at integers, then you just have to move terms around a little bit. So we really can deal with that case. It's just not as nice of a sum. So for example, in this case, you get 2 pi i and the sum from um, minus n to n of f of n such that n is not a singularity of f. That is, if they're not poles, those chunks. And then you get these pieces here at the, uh, at the singularities. So this is all both of these guys, um, both here and here are all just cases of this, right? We're just splitting up some sums and then using the fact that the residues of G we're just assuming by construction of how we made G, how we decided to choose G, that for these pieces here, right here, right? We're just saying, hey, the residues of G at the integers will be one. Okay, and one such choice that we can use is something like pi cotangent of pi C. Okay. So this gives us the summation theorem as it's called. So if F is, let me get my highlighter out, analytic in C, except for finitely many, important, finitely many isolated singularities, then we're going to build a weird little square right now. We're going to let CN be a square with vertices at N plus one half times plus or minus one plus or minus I for n is one, two, three, so on. That is, it's like this square, right? So it is a square enclosing minus n to n, right? And uh, it's not, it, it's, the edges are halfway between n and n plus one, right? And it's, it's symmetric, it's just a square, right? So all the side lengths are the same. Okay, easy enough, easy enough. So this will be our contour. We're gonna call this cn, okay. So, we'll suppose that the contour integral about cn of pi cotangent pi z f of z dz goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So this is kind of one of those like uh, growth rate conditions, just like we had last time. This will give us the so-called summation formula, which is that the limit as n goes to infinity of this piece, the sum from minus n to n of fn such that m is, n is not a singularity of f, that is, we're, we're summing only over those values of n between minus n and n such that, only those values of little n, sorry, it sounds confusing when you say it out loud, when you're just dealing with low, uppercase and lowercase, but um, between minus n and n, big n's, um, you're summing up f of little n only over those values of little n that are not singularities of f, this limit is equal to minus the residues of pi cotangent pi z f of z at the singularities of f. So here you're summing up over the non-singularities contained in this little window, the limit of that, and that's going to be equal to these ones, the residues at the singularities of f. Okay, now why do we know that this value exists when we have to do like a limit over here? Well, it's because there's finitely many isolated singularities for f right? So in the case that none of these uh, n's here are um, singularities of f, that is if all the singularities, if none of the singularities are integers, then this limit exists, is finite, and is equal to, well, the right hand side, minus the residues of pi cotangent pi z f of z at the singularities of f. Okay, cool. So you could also write this piece right here, as the sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity of uh, fn, right? So this doubly infinite sum is equal to uh, a finite sum of residues. Kind of cool, right? It's maybe not obvious. I think that if you just kind of look at it and you say, hey, if you sum from negative infinity to infinity, some function like this pi cotangent of pi z have anything to do with that? You would go, why would it? Answer is it does. That's weird, right? Complex analysis in places you would never expect. So uh, it is important though that we keep track of a few things. That is 
we need to we need to be careful to to say that we're using a symmetric form of our summation that is this is exactly like when we were doing the Cauchy principal value last time we were saying like hey we could vary the you know integrate from negative infinity to infinity you know you could vary the upper and lower bounds on that improper integral in terms of the limits defining it you could vary them separately or you could vary them jointly together and have them be the same right um if you do the second one this nice symmetrized form then you can maybe get like a principal value while in the other case of y y you can define something that could be a prince like the principal value right while the other case may not even have an actual value right so this formula this is a format for the limit of the symmetric partial sums right that is we're looking at from you know like like we're, we're doing the top and the bottom pieces here the same, but you could just as easily take n and minus m, uh, you know, separately right here and sum like that, right? From uh, little n equals minus m to big N and then have the limit of big N, big M go to infinity, right? And so th th that, that piece will only exist when both of these like unidirectionally infinite uh, sums exist, right? So, you know, the limit as m goes to infinity of the sum from n equals minus m to minus 1 of f of n, um, plus the limit as n goes to infinity of n equals 0 to n of f of little n, right? If each of those guys exist, then this double limit exists, and then this thing properly exists, right? So that's, it's kind of like we should maybe say that there's some, uh, we should maybe be careful and that's why we always are writing it like uh like this here i may abuse that and write what i wrote right here and i am fine if you do that as long as you are aware of this caveat which is that this piece defined in this way does not necessarily exists just because the symmetrized version does so if the doubly infinite series does converge then it gives exactly the same answer as the symmetrized version so if if this double sum if each of this guy here and this guy here if both of those guys exist then you'll get the same answer out as what we just got from all this other stuff but it is possible from the summation formula to get an answer to get a value to this thing right to the symmetrized form when this thing here does not properly actually exist right so this is exactly like what we were doing with the Cauchy principal value you just have to be careful of that a little bit um, now if you want to uh, you know uh, kind of just brush that under the rug feel free for all intents and purposes but it it bears mentioning because i don't want to give you any false impressions about what the actual nature of the summations we're doing uh what they are um it is not necessarily the case that these double limits exist so that that caveat aside one question you might have is okay summation formula theorem seems great but what the heck how do i know that this thing goes to zero as n goes to infinity that is how do i know that the contour integral about cn the square um of pi cotangent pi z f of z dz how do i know that that goes to zero as n goes to infinity like this is like a weird contour to be integrating right it's like not that messy but i don't want to compute it dude it's going to be brutal right so here's one situation that could make your life a little bit easy Proposition 4.4.2 might help you out if you are trying to do certain things. It um, at least is like a good result to know about to make that last one a little bit more useful. So if F is analytic on C except for isolated singularities, then if there are constants R and M greater than zero, such that in modulus Z F of Z is less than or equal to M whenever the modulus of Z is greater than or equal to R, then the hypothesis of hypotheses of the summation theorem are satisfied so then you can conclude what the summation theorem tells you 
Oh, okay, cool. So it's kind of a, at least a, it's at least a relatively easy test to check for certain things. Um, you, it doesn't say, it, you, you know, there are things where the, the summation theorem will work, but this is not true, right? This is not the only case that can happen. But if you go, hey, Z, F of Z, is that, is that bounded for large values of uh, Z? Or at least in modulus large Z. So if that's true, then you can use it. So let's, let's do kind of an example. Um, this one's kind of fun. Uh, so we'll introduce this function a lot more later, but uh, the so-called zeta function, this is Riemann's zeta function evaluated at two. So Riemann's zeta function, which I, uh, I always do a horrible draw, job of drawing my zetas, is uh, defined as, um, well, and I don't want to say it's defined this way yet, but I will for now. I'll say that it's one over n to the z. It's the sum from one to infinity. Obviously, this is uh, for, for z strictly greater than one, then by, you know, like the p-series test, uh, this converges and you actually get a value, right? So in... Uh, this this guy will be analytic um, on the part of the complex plane with modulus or with um, modulus z greater than one, right? Um, this is not normally the function that people are referring to when they talk about the Riemann zeta function. They're referring normally to um, an analytic continuation of this guy, which we will talk about later. But I just thought I'd mention it right now. We'll actually get to that in a bit and be able to actually describe what that is. Not in today's lecture, but this is zeta of 2. So I'm going to show you that zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6. That is, I'm going to show you that the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared is equal to pi squared over 6. Oh, sweet. Okay, let's do it. So we're going to apply the summation theorem. Uh, so f of z is going to be 1 over z squared. That seems totally fair because I have 1 over n squared here. I'm just going to replace that n with a z. Now, tangent has a simple 0 at z equals 0. Um, so cotangent has a simple pole there. If the Laurent expansion of cotangent of z is b1 over z plus a0 plus a1z plus so on, right? Then you can write out 1 minus c squared over 2 factorial plus z to the fourth over four factorial minus so on, right? And just break this apart like this. Now I have z minus z cubed over three factorial plus z to the fifth over five factorial minus z to the seventh over seven factorial, so on, right? Times b1 over z plus a naught plus a one z and so on all the way out, right? Multiplying and collecting terms and looking at the coefficients, b1 will be 1, a0 will be 0, and a1 will be 1 minus 1 third. Why is this? So if, you, if, you, if you see it, think about it. Okay. Um, so hopefully that's sunk in. Um, just distribute everything out and compare compare the like terms, right? B1 is 1 because when you multiply z by B1 over z, you're going to get just a B1. And so that will be the constant term, which is 1, right? And then, okay, so on and so on, right? So it, it turns out there's no squared term, so you get that A0, which will be A0z, right? At least that term will appear. Right, and then, so then you get, okay, there's no A0, Z, so A0 has to be zero, right? There's no Z term over here, and so on. So, okay, not to belabor that point. So, pi cotangent of pi Z over Z squared. Well, we're just gonna multiply by pi, divide by Z squared, right? And then we just go through and do this, we get, 1 over z cubed minus pi squared over z times 1 third, and so on and so on. And doesn't matter anything after that because all we're looking for is the residue. 
that is the residue of pi cotangent pi z over z squared at zero is minus pi squared over three, right? Why, why is that? It's from this right here, right? Pi squared over three, the minus pi squared over three, that's the coefficient of one over z in this expansion. So that's the residue, right? Okay, so the only singularity of f is at z equals zero, right? Since f is one over z squared, yeah? Okay, summation formula then becomes, well, we're summing from, as n goes to negative infinity from negative n up to minus one, these pieces, and then from one to n, n squared. Notice what we're summing here is n is not, not a singularity of f, right? So this is the piece where it's not a singularity, right? And the other side is the piece where we do have a singularity, right? And notice we have this minus sign right here. So instead of getting minus pi squared over three, we get pi squared over three. Okay. So we're summing everything except when n is zero, right? Okay, and since one over minus n squared is equal to one over n squared. Well, this is just two of the same things, right? So I just get double that, right? So this is limit as n goes to infinity of this guy. And I could just do a two here and scratch this piece out, right? You see what I'm saying? Two times this limit right there. And so just divide by that two. And we produce our result. The sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n squared is pi squared over six. Oh, uh, awesome. Summation theorem, residue theorem in action, a beautiful result. All right, um, if you aren't noticing, we're not proving uh, this, this, this theorem today. I wanna make sure we don't uh, fall victim to what happened with, uh, with the last section. Um, so let's, let's go on a little bit more. We'll talk about partial fraction expansions. So partial fractions, Everyone remembers partial fractions potentially fondly, but also maybe not. Um, I'm guessing probably not. People tend to not like partial fractions, um, even if they don't despise regular fractions. Partial fractions are kind of annoying to compute. All the same, partial fraction decompositions are very useful in uh, calculus at least. So. If you have f of z is p of z over q of z, then f can be expanded in partial fractions in terms of the zeros of the denominator. That is in terms of the zeros of q of z. Now, what we want to do here is essentially use the residue theorem trick that we just did, or something quite similar to it, to basically try to keep the analogy of a meromorphic function um, at, is sort of like a rational function with possibly infinitely many zeros in the denominator. That is, it's something like a, like a rational, well, I mean, you, you know exactly what we're talking about because if you write a meromorphic function, it's got like the Laurent series uh, around any point sort of says it's like, hey, you got these coefficients and powers of one over Z, and then you've got these coefficients with powers of z, and we put them all together, add them up, and uh, there you go, that's what your function is like. And so it's sort of like, hey, basically this guy is like a limit of rational functions, sort of, right? Um, you can think of it like that. Um, we've, we've talked before about this uh, rational function analogy. I don't wanna belabor the point or say something incorrect accidentally um, and give anyone the wrong idea. But basically, if you think about it like, you know, holomorphic over holomorphic or something like that, analytic over analytic, this is kind of the idea that in some sense, meromorphic functions are the analog to rational functions in the complex plane, albeit a much more complicated analog. You shouldn't take this analogy too seriously. But we can actually do something kind of like the partial fractions trick. So maybe you can take it at least a little bit seriously, but just not too seriously. All right, so kind of the idea is summed up here in proposition 4.4.4. So if Z is any complex number not equal to an integer, then 
the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over z minus n plus 1 over n, that quantity, as well as the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 plus 1 over z plus n minus 1 over n, that, that guy, both absolutely converge and i cotangent of pi z, this great candidate for that capital G of z function we were using earlier, right? This guy is equal to 1 over z. That's that's pretty obvious um, from the... Well, oh, sorry, I'll, just, I'll stop. Um, 1 over z plus these two absolutely convergent sums. Okay. So this holds for any complex number not equal to an integer. Okay, cool. How can we use this? Well... Hopefully it is relatively clear from what we just did. The idea, let, let, let's say it and then let's look back at it and see how they line up. So the idea is summed up in the partial fractions theorem as it's called. So suppose F is meromorphic with simple poles at A1, A2, A3, so on, at AK for some number of them. Um, and let's suppose these guys are sorted, at least in modulus. That is, A1 in modulus is bigger than zero, bigger than A2, and so on. And let's also suppose that we have residues BK at AK. Um, we're going to be careful and assume that F is analytic at zero. That is, if we're assuming that A1 is a pole, and in modulus is greater than zero, and all the rest of them are bigger than A1 in modulus, then it can't have a pole at zero. F can't, right? So, okay, so... What we're assuming right now, F is meromorphic, has simple poles at a number of points, none, none of which are zero. And then we're writing BK for the residue of F at AK. Okay, now we're gonna assume, this is kind of the technical piece, that the sequence R1, R2, R3, so on, um, with that the, there is a sequence R1, R2, R3, with the property that the limit as N goes to infinity of these RNs is infinity right that it doesn't exist but it doesn't exist precisely in this way that it gets big right and that there are simple closed curves cn such that these three conditions hold the modulus of z is greater than or equal to rn for all z on cn that is these cn's are big enough curves if you want to think of it like that that is they can they're they're all like outside of a disk of radius uh, rn right there is a constant s with length cn greater or c with uh there's a constant s such that the length of cn is less than or equal to s times rn for all n okay that one we need maybe a little bit more unpacking so the length of cn if uh if CN is a simple closed curve, it's like how far around does it go? What is its like perimeter, if you want to think of it like that, like a shape kind of, right? The, the perimeter there is S times RN, right? For all N, that there is just one constant S acting as this upper bound. That is, so since the modulus of Z is greater than or equal to RN for all Z on CN, this bounding, like inner bound, right? You've got your CN out here, right? And you've got your inner bound, right? And you've got some like RN, here's your CN, right? That's the distance of the, the radius of this circle, right? RN, here's your CN. All the Z's in modulus are greater than or equal to RN for all the Z's on CN, right? See what I'm saying? Okay, so this length constant, S, so if you take the length of this CN and divide it by RN, then that's less than or equal to S. So it sort of says that like, okay, maybe it gets bigger and bigger, but it doesn't like wiggle too much and have that length get, uh, length grow way too fast, right? So for example, if the CN was uh, a circle, right? just a circle of radius a little bit bigger than Rn, right? Okay, um, and even you could have it actually just be a straight up circle and have Rn be its radius, a circle of radius Rn, right? Then we're looking at the diameter divided by 
the radius. And what do we get? Oh, so I mean, it, sorry, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm overly putting this to it, but in that case, what is uh, circumference divided by diameter? It's pi. So we would get, um, oh, I guess in this case it would be um, circumference divided by two radius is pi. So this would be uh, two pi. You would get out for s in that case, right? Okay. Similarly, we have one more conclusion. Um, so basically what we're saying is that, hey, like the tightest wrapping you can get gives you like two pi for s and then it could be bigger but we're trying to say that there's one that bounds them all right okay so it's just a constant growth factor on the ratio of the length to the inner bounding radius and then there's a constant m with the modulus of f of z less than or equal to m for all z on cn and for all n mm. that is the same m works for all n okay Hmm. This means that as you go out, this f of z doesn't get bigger or something like that, right? So if it gets big, it can only do so before, like at before r1, right? You know, at, at not at these nice places. If that works, if you have these three things, kind of technical conditions, they don't necessarily seem so intuitive. But if you have them, if you can show them, then what you get out is that f of z equals f of zero plus the sum from n equals one to infinity of bn over z minus an plus bn over an. This is kind of like a partial fractions decomposition, right? Why? Well, because the ans are simple poles of the denominator, right? Or I mean, are simple poles of f, that is the zeros of the denominator, right? If you think of f kind of like, um, you know, a rational function. The way, same way you can take a rational function and doing partial fractions, um, expand it in terms of the zeros of the denominator. If you think of a rational or um, a meromorphic function's poles as zeros of the denominator, so to speak, what we're doing is we're writing this in terms of the zeros of the denominator. Yeah? Hmm, kind of cool. The thing that we're learning is that on top, these coefficients that go on top that you used to you know have to solve for when you were doing partial fractions here we're getting them from residues at least in this nice case so this this what we're showing you here is a uh particularly in my opinion kind of brutally technical version of uh the metaga leffler theorem um so cn's people normally use circles of radius rn or big squares or something like that um but like I said, this is a much more general result, uh, or there is a much more general result that fully encompasses this one. It's called the metag leffler theorem, named after the famous uh, Swedish mathematician Ungolste metag leffler um, And uh, it is a cool theorem. metag leffler did a lot of great work, and I am a big fan, personally. But that's kind of neat that you can do this, right? Eh, all right. So that sort of tells us our general story and you can do lots of cool things like like this trick to say hey sum all of the uh you know one two three four five six seven eight nine ten like sum them all uh, take them square them put them on the bottom of a fraction sum that up what do you get out oh my god like you, you have a sense that you should get something out but like what is it how would you know it's pi squared over six that's cool right it's it's it gives you some kind of magic seeming results it is cool and i i enjoy this much more than going hey see that brutal integral that you don't want to do guess what you can use complex analysis to do it in kind of an annoying way this is much cooler that you can go hey here's something that feels like here's a sum that feels at least to me like a relatively natural thing to look at, right? Like that's not a crazy sum. Just like, hey, you know, add, add one over, you know, counting numbers squared. What, what, what do we get? It's cool that we can actually finally answer that question. I personally find that very sat satisfying. Um, and all things considered, this is so much shorter of a section than the previous one, the um, integration one, because integration stuff is super messy 
Um, and the techniques we had, while clever and neat, are very involved. All of those statements of the theorems were just like brutally long and kind of hard to keep track of. So this part feels much cleaner to me. I hope you enjoy it more as well. The partial fractions piece, uh, I'm not even going to do an example on, but uh, maybe I'll do one next time. Um, it just it's just a cool good thing um, to know and I find that satisfying on a theoretical level and I hope you do too um, because it tells us that our intuition about rational functions carries over into our intuition about meromorphic functions kind of neat and uh, oh oh like I promised before I forget um, here is a hint for a problem on your homework this is not due until after the exam, so I imagine no one will look at this for quite some time. But when you're asked to show that the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of minus 1 to the n minus 1 over 2n minus 1 to the third is equal to pi cubed over 32, this is a place where you may want to use something other than uh, pi cotangent pi z as your g function in the summation theorem. Um, I would instead recommend maybe using something like pi over sine pi z. This guy has poles at the integers and the residue of pi divided by sine pi z at n is equal to minus one to the n. That might tell you how to do something like this, right? That is if you go back to what we were doing just kind of at the very start and you say, hey, Notice how we got this piece right here was just because when we did the residues of g of z, f of z, well, at those poles of g of z, which were the integers, we got 1 at all of them. Now, if instead we got minus 1 to the n, then we would get like an alternating sum of these fn's, right? And so just using a different g, we can capture some of that. So the g that I might recommend you use here would be something like pi sine pi z or you know your pi divided by sine pi z um something like that might help you there are other options as well but that one maybe is a good one i don't know um all right cool so there's there's your hint for that um i imagine no one will look at that until uh long after you're done with an exam so i think that's a good place to call it for tonight um hopefully everyone had a great weekend welcome back and we're almost at the end of this class. Um, cool. See you next time.